Chapter 5 It was not far from Paola's luxurious house of pleasure to the busy back streets where Leonardo's workshop was. But Ezio did have to cross the spacious and busy Piazza del Duomo, and here he found his newly acquired skills of merging into the crowd especially useful. It was a good ten days since the executions, and it was likely that Alberti would imagine that Ezio would have left Florence long since. But Ezio was taking no chances, and nor, by the look of the number of guards posted in and around the square, was Alberti. There would be plain-clothes agents in place as well. Ezio kept his head well down, especially when passing between the cathedral and the baptistry, where the square was busiest. He passed by Giotto's Campanile, which had dominated the city for almost 150 years, and the great red mass of Brunelleschi's cathedral dome, completed only 15 years earlier, without seeing them, though he was aware of groups of French and Spanish tourists gazing up in unfeigned amazement and admiration, and a little burst of pride in his city tugged at his heart. But was it his city, really, any more? Suppressing any gloomy thoughts, he quickly made his way from the south of the piazza to Leonardo's workshop. The master was at home, he was told, in the yard at the back. The studio was, if anything, in a greater state of chaos than ever, though there did seem to be some rough method in the madness. The artefacts Ezio had noticed on his earlier visit had been added to, and from the ceiling hung a strange contraption in wood, though it looked like a scaled-up skeleton of a bat. On one of the easels, a large parchment pinned to a board carried a massive and impossibly intricate knot design, and in a corner of it some indecipherable scribbling in Leonardo's hand. Agnolo had been joined by another assistant, Innocento, and the two were trying to impose some order on the studio, cataloguing the stuff in order to keep track of it. He's in the backyard, Agnolo told Ezio. Just go through. He won't mind. Ezio found Leonardo engaged in a curious activity. Everywhere in Florence you could buy caged songbirds. People hung them in their windows for pleasure, and when they died, simply replaced them. Leonardo was surrounded by a dozen such cages, and, as Ezio watched, he selected one, opened the little wicker door, held the cage up and watched as the linnet, in this case, found the entrance, pushed its way through, and flew free. Leonardo watched its departure keenly, and was turning to pick up another cage when he noticed Ezio standing there. He smiled winningly and warmly at the sight of him, and embraced him. Then his face grew grave. Ezio, my friend! I hardly expected to see you here after what you've been through, but welcome, welcome. Just bear with me one minute, this won't take long. Ezio watched as he released one after another of the various thrushes, bullfinches, larks, and far more expensive nightingales into the air, watching each one very carefully. What are you doing? asked Ezio, wonderingly. All life is precious, Leonardo replied simply. I cannot bear to see my fellow creatures imprisoned like this just because they have fine voices. Is that the only reason you release them? Ezio suspected an ulterior motive. Leonardo grinned, but gave no direct answer. I won't eat meat any more, either. Why should some poor animal die just because it tastes good to us? There'd be no work for farmers else. They could all grow corn. Imagine how boring that'd be. Anyway, there'd be a glut. Ah, I was forgetting that you're a finanziatore. And I am forgetting my manners. What brings you here? I need a favour, Leonardo. How can I be of service? There's something I inherited from my father that I'd like you to repair, if you can. Leonardo's eyes lit up. Of course. Come this way. We'll use my inner chamber. Those boys are cluttering everything up in the studio as usual. I sometimes wonder why I bother to employ them at all. Ezio smiled. He was beginning to see why. 
but at the same time sensed that Leonardo's first love was, and would always be, his work. Come this way. Leonardo's smaller, inner room was even more untidy than the studio. But among the masses of books and specimens, and papers covered with that indecipherable scrawl, the artist, as always, and incongruously, impeccably dressed and scented, carefully piled some stuff on other stuff until a space was cleared on a large drafting table. Forgive the confusion, he said, but at last we have an oasis. Let's see what you've got for me. Unless you'd like a glass of wine first? Uh, no, no. Good, said Leonardo eagerly. Let's see it then. Ezio carefully extracted the blade, bracer, and mechanism, which he had previously wrapped in the mysterious vellum page that had accompanied them. Leonardo tried in vain to put the pieces of machinery back together, but failed, and seemed for a moment to despair. I don't know, Ezio, he said. This mechanism is old, very old, but it's very sophisticated as well. And its construction is ahead, I would say, even of our time. Fascinating, he looked up. I've certainly never seen anything like it. But I'm afraid there's little I can do without the original plans. Then he turned his attention to the vellum page, which he had picked up in order to wrap Ezio's pieces back up again. Wait a second, he cried, poring over it. Then he placed the broken blade and bracer to one side, spread out the sheet, and, referring to it, began to rummage among a row of old books and manuscripts on a nearby shelf. Finding the two he wanted, he placed them on the table and began carefully to leaf through them. What are you doing? asked Ezio, slightly impatiently. This is very interesting, said Leonardo. This looks very like a page from a codex. A what? It's a page from an ancient book. This isn't printed, it's in manuscript. It's very old indeed. Have you any more of them? No. Pity. People shouldn't tear the pages out of books like this. Leonardo paused. Unless, perhaps, the whole thing together... What? Nothing. Look, the contents of this page are encrypted, but if my theory is correct, based on these sketches, it may very well be that... Ezio waited, but Leonardo was lost in a world of his own. He took a seat and waited patiently while Leonardo rummaged through and pored over a number of books and scrolls, making cross-references and notes, all in that curious left-handed mirror-writing he used. Ezio wasn't the only one, he supposed, to live his life with one eye looking behind him. From the little he'd seen of what was going on in the studio, if the church got wind of some of the things Leonardo was up to, he didn't doubt that his friend would be for the high jump. At last, Leonardo looked up, but by that time Ezio was beginning to doze. Remarkable, muttered Leonardo to himself, and then in a louder voice, Remarkable! If we transpose the letters and then select every third, he set to work, drawing the blade, bracer, and mechanism towards him. He dug out a toolbox from under the table, set up a vice, and quietly became absorbed in his work. An hour passed. Two. Ezio by now was sleeping peacefully, lulled by the warm fug of the room and the gentle sounds of tapping and scraping as Leonardo worked on. And at last, Ezio, wake up! Eh? Look! And Leonardo pointed to the tabletop. The dagger blade, fully restored, had been fitted into the strange mechanism, which in turn was fixed to the bracer. Everything was polished and looked as if it had just been made, but nothing shone. A matte finish, I decided, said Leonardo. Like Roman armour. Anything which shines glints in the sun, and that's a dead giveaway. Ezio picked up the weapon and hefted it in his hands. It was light, but the strong blade was perfectly balanced on it. Ezio had never seen anything like it. A spring-loaded dagger that he could conceal above his wrist. All he had to do was flex his hand and the blade would spring out, 
ready to slash or stab as its user desired. I thought you were a man of peace, said Ezio, remembering the birds. Ideas take precedence, said Leonardo with decision, whatever they are. Now, he added, producing a hammer and chisel from his toolbox, you're right-handed, aren't you? Good. Then kindly place your right ring finger on this block. What are you doing? I'm sorry, but this is how it must be done. The blade is designed to ensure the total commitment of whoever wields it. What do you mean? It'll only work if we have that finger off. Ezio blinked. His mind flashed on a number of images. He remembered Alberti's supposed friendliness to his father, how Alberti had later reassured him after his father's arrest, the executions, his own pursuit. He clamped his jaw. Do it. Maybe I should use a cleaver. Clean a cut that way. Leonardo produced one from a drawer in the table. Now, just place your finger. Così. Ezio steeled himself as Leonardo raised the cleaver. He closed his eyes as he heard it brought down, shunk, into the wood of the block. But he'd felt no pain. He opened his eyes. The cleaver was stuck in the block, inches from his hand, which was intact. You bastard! Ezio was shocked and furious at this tasteless practical joke. Leonardo raised his hands. Calm yourself. <laughs> it was just a bit of fun. Cruel, I admit, but I simply couldn't resist. I wanted to see how determined you were. You see, the use of this machine originally did require such a sacrifice. Something to do with an ancient initiation ceremony, I think. But I've made one or two adjustments so you can keep your finger. Look, the blade comes out well clear of them and I've added a hilt that flips out when the blade's extended. All you have to do is remember to keep them splayed as it's coming out, so you can keep your finger. But you might like to wear gloves when you use it. The blade is keen. Ezio was too fascinated and grateful to be angry for long. This is extraordinary, he said, opening and closing the dagger several times until he could time its use perfectly. Incredible! Isn't it? agreed Leonardo. Are you sure you don't have any more pages like this one? I'm sorry. Well, listen, if you do happen across any more, please bring them to me. You have my word. And how much do I owe you for? A pleasure. Most instructive. There is no... They were interrupted by a hammering at the outer door of the studio. Leonardo hurried through to the front of the building as Agnolo and Innocento looked up fearfully. The person on the other side of the door had started to bellow. Open up! By order of the Florentine guard! Just a moment! Leonardo shouted back, but in a lower voice he said to Ezio, Stay back there. Then he opened the door and stood in it, blocking the guardsman's way. You Leonardo da Vinci! asked the guard in one of those loud, bullying, official voices. "'What can I do for you?' said Leonardo, moving out into the street, obliging the guard to step back. "'I'm empowered to ask you certain questions.' Leonardo had by now so manoeuvred himself that the guard had his back to the doorway of the studio. "'What seems to be the trouble?' "'We've had a report that you were seen just now consorting with a known enemy of the city.' What, me? Consorting? Preposterous. When was the last time you either saw or spoke to Ezio Auditore? Who? Don't play silly buggers with me. We know you were close to the family. Sold the mother a couple of your daubs. Maybe I need to refresh your memory a bit. And the guard hit Leonardo in the stomach with the butt of his halberd. With a sharp cry of pain... Leonardo doubled up and fell to the ground where the guard kicked him. Ready to chat now, are we? I don't like artists. Load of poofs. 
But this had given Ezio enough time to step quietly through the doorway and position himself behind the guard. The street was deserted. The nape of the man's sweaty neck was exposed. It was as good a time as any to give his new toy a trial run. He raised his hand, triggered the release mechanism, and the silent blade shot out. With a deft movement of his now open right hand, Ezio stabbed once into the side of the guard's neck. The recently honed edge of the blade was viciously sharp and eased through the man's jugular without the slightest resistance. The guard fell, dead before he hit the ground. Ezio helped Leonardo up. Thank you, said the shaken artist. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to kill him. There was no time. Sometimes we don't have an alternative. But I should be used to this by now. What do you mean? I was involved in the Saltarelli case. Ezio remembered then. A young artist's model, Jacopo Saltarelli, had been anonymously denounced a few weeks earlier for practising prostitution, and Leonardo, along with three others, had been accused of patronising him. The case had fallen apart for lack of evidence, but some of the mud had stuck. But we don't prosecute homosexual men here, he said. Why, I seem to remember that the Germans have a nickname for them. They call them Florenza. It's still officially against the law, said Leonardo dryly. You can still get fined. And with men like Alberti in charge. What about the body? Oh, said Leonardo, it's quite a windfall. Help me drag it inside before anyone sees us. I'll put it with the others. Windfall? Others? The cellar's quite cold. They keep for a week. I get one or two cadavers that no one else wants from the hospital now and then. All unofficial, of course. But I cut them open and dig about a bit. It helps me with my research. Ezio looked at his friend more than curiously. What? I think I told you. I like to find out how things work. They dragged the body out of sight, and Leonardo's two assistants manhandled it through a door down some stone steps out of sight. But what if they send someone after him to find out what happened to him? Leonardo shrugged. I'll deny all knowledge, he winked. I'm not without powerful friends here, Ezio. Ezio was nonplussed. He said, Well, you seem confident enough. Just don't mention this incident to anyone else. I won't. And thank you, Leonardo, for everything. A pleasure. And don't forget, a hungry look had crept into his eyes, if you find any more pages from this codex, bring them to me. Who knows what other new designs they might contain. I promise. Ezio made his way back to Paola's house in triumphant mood, though he did not forget to lose himself in the anonymity of the crowd as he passed back north through the town. Paola greeted him with some relief. You were gone longer than I'd expected. Leonardo likes to talk. But that's not all he did, I hope. Oh no, look. And he showed her the wrist dagger extending it from his sleeve with an extravagant flourish and a boyish grin. Impressive. Yes. Ezio looked at it admiringly. I'll need a bit of practice with it. I want to keep all my own fingers. Paola looked serious. Well, Ezio, it looks as if you're all set. I've given you the skills you need. Leonardo has repaired your weapon. She took a breath. All that's needed now is for you to do the deed. Yes, said Ezio quietly, his expression darkening again. The question is, how best to gain access to Messer Alberti? Paola looked thoughtful. Duke Lorenzo is back with us. He isn't happy about the executions Alberti authorised in his absence, but he doesn't have the power to challenge the Gonfalonieri. Nevertheless, there's to be a vernissage for Maestro Verrocchio's latest work at the cloister of Santa Croce tomorrow night. All Florentine society will be there, including Alberti. She looked at him. 
I think you should be, too. Ezio found out that the piece of sculpture to be unveiled was a bronze statue of David, the biblical hero with whom Florence associated itself, poised as the city was between the twin Goliaths of Rome to the south and the land-hungry kings of France to the north. It had been commissioned by the Medici family and was destined to be installed in the Palazzo Vecchio. The maestro had started work on it three or four years earlier, and a rumour had been going round that the head was modelled on one of Verrocchio's handsomer young apprentices of the time, a certain Leonardo da Vinci. At any rate, there was great excitement, and people were already dithering about what to wear for the occasion. Ezio had other matters to ponder. Watch over my mother and sister while I'm gone, he asked Paola, as if they were my own. And if anything should happen to me, have faith, and it won't. Ezio made his way to Santa Croce in good time the following evening. He had spent the previous hours preparing himself and honing his skills with his new weapon until he was satisfied that he was fully proficient in its use. His thoughts dwelt on the deaths of his father and brothers, and the cruel tones of Alberti's voice as he passed sentence rang all too clearly in his mind. As he approached, he saw two figures whom he recognised walking ahead of him, slightly apart from a small squad of bodyguards, whose uniform displayed a badge of five red balls on a yellow ground. They appeared to be arguing, and he hurried forward to bring himself within earshot of them. They paused in front of the portico of the church, and he hovered nearby, out of sight, to listen. The men addressed each other in tight-lipped tones. One was Uberto Alberti, the other a slim young man in his mid to late twenties, with a prominent nose and a determined face, was richly dressed in a red cap and cloak over which he wore a silver-grey tunic. Duke Lorenzo, Il Magnifico, as his subjects called him, to the disgust of the Pazzi and their faction. You cannot tax me with this, Alberti was saying. I acted on information received and irrefutable evidence. I acted within the law and within the bounds of my office. No, you overstepped your bounds, Gonfalonieri, and you took advantage of my absence from Florence to do so. I am more than displeased. Who are you to speak of bounds? You have seized power over this city, made yourself duke of it, without the formal consent of the Signoria or anyone else. I have done no such thing. Alberti permitted himself a sardonic laugh. Of course you'd say that. Ever the innocent. How convenient for you. You surround yourself at Careggi with men most of the rest of us consider dangerous free thinkers, Ficino, Mirandola, and that creep Poliziano. But at least now we have had a chance to see how far your reach really extends, which is to say, nowhere at all in any practical terms. That has proved a valuable lesson for my allies and me. Yes, your allies the Patsy. That's what this is really all about, isn't it? Alberti studied his fingernails elaborately before replying. I'd be careful what you say, Duce. You might attract the wrong sort of attention. But he didn't sound completely sure of himself. You are the one who should watch his mouth, Gonfalonieri, and I suggest you pass that advice on to your associates. Take it as a friendly warning. With that... Lorenzo swept away with his bodyguard in the direction of the cloister. After a moment, muttering some oath under his breath, Alberti followed. It almost sounded to Ezio as if the man were cursing himself. The cloisters themselves had been draped with cloth of gold for the occasion, which dazzlingly reflected the light from hundreds of candles. On a rostrum near the fountain in the centre, a group of musicians played, and on another stood the bronze statue, a half-life-size figure of exquisite beauty. As Ezio entered, using columns and shadows to conceal himself, he could see Lorenzo complimenting the artist. 
Etsy also recognised the mysterious cowled figure who'd been on the execution platform with Alberti. Some distance away, Alberti himself stood surrounded by admiring members of the local nobility. From what he could hear, Ezio understood that they were congratulating the Gonfalonieri on ridding the city of the canker of the Auditore family. He had not thought that his father had so many enemies as well as friends in the city, but realised that they had only dared move against him when his principal ally, Lorenzo, had been absent. Ezio smiled as one noblewoman told Alberti that she hoped the Duke appreciated his integrity. It was clear that Alberti didn't like that suggestion one bit. Then he overheard more. What of the other son? a nobleman was asking. Ezio, wasn't it? Has he escaped for good? Alberti managed to smile. The boy poses no danger whatsoever. Soft hands and an even softer head. He'll be caught and executed before the week is out. The company around him laughed. So, what's next for you, Uberto? asked another man. The chair of the Signoria, perhaps? Alberti spread his hands. It is as God wills. My only interest is to continue to serve Florence faithfully and diligently. Well, whatever you choose, know that you have our support. That is most gratifying. We'll see what the future brings. Alberti beamed, but modestly. And now, my friends, I suggest that we put politics aside and give ourselves over to the enjoyment of this sublime work of art so generously donated by the noble Medici. Ezio waited until Alberti's companions wandered away in the direction of the David. For his part, Alberti took a goblet of wine and surveyed the scene, a mixture of satisfaction and wariness in his eyes. Ezio knew that this was his opportunity. All other eyes were on the statue, near which Verrocchio was stumbling through a short speech. Ezio slipped up to Alberti's side. It must have stuck in your craw to pay that last compliment, Ezio hissed. But it's appropriate that you should be insincere to the end. Recognising him, Alberti's eyes bulged in terror. You! Yes, Gonfalonieri, it's Ezio. Here to avenge the murder of my father, your friend, and my innocent brothers. Alberti heard the dull click of a spring, a metallic sound and saw the blade poised at his throat. "'Goodbye, Gonfalonieri,' said Ezio coldly. "'Stop!' gasped Alberti. "'In my position you would have done the same. "'To protect the ones you loved. "'Forgive me, Ezio, I had no choice.' Ezio leant close, ignoring his plea. He knew the man had had a choice, an honourable one, and had been too supine to make it. Do you not think I am not protecting the ones I love? What mercy would you show my mother or my sister if you could lay your hands on them? Now, where are the documents I gave you from my father? You must have them somewhere safe. You'll never get them. I always carry them on my person. Alberti tried to push Ezio away and drew in a breath to call for the guards, but Ezio plunged the dagger into his throat and dragged its blade through the man's jugular artery. Unable now even to gurgle, Alberti sank to his knees, his hands instinctively clutching at his neck in a vain attempt to staunch the blood that cascaded down onto the grass. As he fell on his side, Ezio stooped swiftly and cut the man's wallet free of his belt. He glanced inside. Alberti, in his final hubris, had been telling the truth. The documents were indeed there. But now there was silence. Verrocchio's speech had ground to a halt as the guests began to turn and stare, not yet comprehending what had happened. Ezio stood and faced them. Yes, what you see is real. What you see is vengeance. The Auditore family still lives. I am still here. Ezio Auditore. 
He caught his breath at the same moment as a woman's voice rang out, Assassino! Now chaos reigned. Lorenzo's bodyguard quickly formed up round him, swords drawn. The guests ran hither and yon, some trying to escape, the braver ones going through the motions at least of trying to seize Ezio, though none quite dared make a real attempt. Ezio noticed the cowled figure slipping away into the shadows. Verrocchio stood protectively by his statue. Women screamed, men shouted, and city guards streamed into the cloisters, unsure of whom to pursue. Ezio took advantage of this, climbing up to the roof of the cloister colonnade and vaulting over it into a courtyard beyond, whose open gate led into the square in front of the church, where a curious crowd was already gathering, attracted by the sound of the commotion within. What's happening? someone asked Ezio. Justice has been done, Ezio replied, before racing northwest across town to the safety of Paola's mansion. He paused on the way to verify the contents of Alberti's wallet. At least the man's last words had been truthful. Everything was there, and there was something else. An undelivered letter in Alberti's hand, Perhaps fresh knowledge for Ezio, who broke the seal and tore the parchment open. But it was a personal note from Alberti to his wife. As he read it, Ezio could at least understand what kind of forces might be brought to bear to break a man's integrity. My love, I put these thoughts to paper in the hope that I might one day have the courage to share them with you. In time you'll no doubt learn that I betrayed Giovanni Auditore, labelled him a traitor, and sentenced him to die. History will likely judge this act to have been a matter of politics and greed. But you must understand that it was not fate that forced my hand, but fear. When the Medici robbed our family of all we owned, I found myself afraid. For you. For our son for the future. What hope is there in this world for a man without proper means? As for the others, they offered me money, land, and title in exchange for my collaboration. And this is how I came to betray my closest friend. However unspeakable the act, it seemed necessary at the time. And even now, looking back, I can see no other way. Ezio folded the letter carefully and replaced it in his wallet. He would reseal it and see that it was delivered. He was determined not to stoop to mean-spiritedness ever. Chapter 6 It's done, he told Paola simply. She embraced him briefly, then stood back. I know. I'm glad to see you safe. I think it's time for me to leave, Florence. Where will you go? My father's brother Mario has an estate near Monteregioni. We'll go there. There's a huge hunt on for you already, Ezio. They're putting up wanted posters everywhere with your picture on them. And the public orators are beginning to speak against you. She paused thoughtfully. I'll get some of my people to go out and tear down as many posters as they can, and the orators can be bribed to speak of other things. Another thought struck her. And I'd better have travel papers drawn up for the three of you. Ezio shook his head, thinking of Alberti. What is this world we live in, where belief can so easily be manipulated? Alberti was placed in what he saw as an impossible position. But he should have held firm against it. She sighed. Truth is traded every day. It's something you'll have to get used to, Ezio. He took her hands in his. Thank you. Florence will be a better place now, especially if Duke Lorenzo can get one of his own men elected Gonfalonieri. But now there is no time to waste. Your mother and sister are here. She turned and clapped her hands. Anetta! 
Annetta emerged from the back of the house, bringing Maria and Claudia with her. It was an emotional reunion. Ezio saw that his mother was not much recovered, and still clasped Petruccio's little box of feathers in her hand. She returned his embrace, though absently, while Paola looked on with a sad smile. Claudia, on the other hand, clung to him. Ezio, where have you been? Paola and Annetta have been so kind, but they won't let us go home, and Mother hasn't spoken a word since... She broke off, fighting her own tears. Well, she said, recovering, perhaps now Father will be able to sort things out for us. It must all have been a dreadful misunderstanding, no? Paola looked at him. This might be the time, she said softly. They will have to know the truth soon. Claudia's gaze shifted from Ezio to Paola and back again. Maria had seated herself next to Annetta, who had her arm around her. Maria stared into space, smiling faintly, caressing the pearwood box. What is it, Ezio? asked Claudia, fear in her voice. Something's happened. What do you mean? Ezio was silent, at a loss for words. But his expression told her everything. Oh, God, no! Claudia, tell me it's not true! Ezio hung his head. No, 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 no! cried Claudia. Shh! he tried to calm her. I did everything I could, Pacina. Claudia buried her head in his chest and cried long, harsh sobs, while Ezio did his best to comfort her. He looked over her head at his mother, but she didn't appear to have heard. Perhaps in her own way she already knew. After all the turmoil that had descended upon Ezio's life, having to witness his sister and his mother thrown into the depths of despair was almost enough to break him. He stood, holding his sister in his arms, for what seemed an eternity, feeling the responsibility of the world on his shoulders. It was up to him to protect his family now. The Auditore name was his to honour. Ezio the boy was no more. He collected his thoughts. Listen, he said to Claudia, once she had quietened a little. What matters now is that we get away from here, somewhere safe where you and Mama can remain in security. But if we are to do that, I need you to be brave. You must be strong for me and look after our mother. Do you understand? She listened, cleared her throat, pulled away from him a little, and looked up at him. Yes. Then we must make our preparations now. Go and pack what you need, but bring little with you. We must leave on foot. A carriage would be too dangerous to organise. Wear your simplest clothes. We must not draw attention to ourselves. And hurry! Claudia left with their mother and Annetta. You should bathe and change, said Paola to him. You'll feel better. Two hours later their travel papers were ready and they could leave. Ezio checked the contents of his satchel carefully one last time. Perhaps his uncle could explain the contents of the documents he had taken from Alberti, which had clearly been of such vital importance to him. His new dagger was strapped to his right forearm, out of sight. He tightened his belt. Claudia led Maria into the garden and stood by the door in the wall by which they were to leave, with Annetta, who was trying not to cry. Ezio turned to Paola. Goodbye, and thank you again for everything. She put her arms round him and kissed him close to his mouth. Stay safe, Ezio, and stay vigilant. I suspect the road ahead of you is yet long. He bowed gravely, then drew up his hood and joined his mother and sister, picking up the bag they had packed. 
They kissed Annetta goodbye, and moments later they were in the street, walking north, Claudia with her arm linked through her mother's. For a while they were silent, and Ezio pondered the great responsibility he had now been obliged to shoulder. He prayed that he would be able to rise to the occasion, but it was hard. He would have to remain strong, but he would manage it for the sake of Claudia and his poor mother, who seemed to have retreated completely into herself. They had reached the centre of the city when Claudia started to speak, and she was full of questions. He noticed with gratification, though, that her voice was firm. How could this have happened to us, she said. I don't know. Do you think we'll ever be able to come back? I don't know, Claudia. What will happen to our house? He shook his head. There had been no time to make any arrangements, and if there had been, with whom could he have made them? Perhaps Duke Lorenzo would be able to close it up, have it guarded. But that was a faint hope. Were they... Were they given a proper funeral? Yes, I... Arranged it myself. They were crossing the Arno, and Ezio allowed himself a glance down river. At last they were approaching the southern city gates, and Ezio was grateful that they had got this far undetected. But it was a dangerous moment, for the gates were heavily policed. Thankfully the documents in false names which Paola had provided them with passed muster, and the guards were on the lookout for a desperate young man on his own, not a modestly dressed little family. They travelled south steadily all that day, pausing only when they were well clear of the city to buy bread, cheese and wine at a farmhouse, and to rest for an hour under the shade of an oak tree at the edge of a cornfield. Ezio had to rein in his impatience, for it was almost thirty miles to Monteregioni, and they had to travel at his mother's pace. She was a strong woman at the beginning of her forties, but the massive shock she had sustained had aged her. He prayed that once they reached Uncle Mario's, she would recover, though he could see that any recovery would be a slow one. He hoped that, barring any setback, they would reach Mario's estate by the afternoon of the following day. That night they spent in a deserted barn, where at least there was clean, warm hay. They dined on the remains of their lunch, and made Maria as comfortable as possible. She made no complaint. Indeed, she seemed completely unaware of her surroundings. But when Claudia tried to take Petruccio's box from her when getting her ready for bed, she protested violently and pushed her daughter away, swearing at her like a fishwife. Brother and sister were shocked at that. But she slept peacefully and seemed refreshed the next morning. They washed themselves in a brook, drank some of its clear water in lieu of breakfast, and continued on their way. It was a bright day, pleasantly warm but with a cooling breeze, and they made good progress passing only a handful of wagons on the road, and seeing no one except the odd group of labourers in the fields and orchards they walked by. Ezio was able to buy some fruit, enough at least for Claudia and his mother, but he wasn't hungry anyway. He was too nervous to eat. At last, in mid-afternoon, he was heartened to see the little walled town of Monteregioni bathed in sunshine on its hill in the distance, Mario effectively ruled the district. Another mile or two and they would be within his territory. Heartened, the little group quickened their pace. Nearly there, he told Claudia with a smile. Grazie a Dio, she replied, returning it. They'd just started to relax when, at a turn in the road, a familiar figure, accompanied by a dozen men in blue and gold liveries, blocked their way. One of the guards carried a standard bearing the hated familiar emblem of golden dolphins and crosses on a blue ground. Ezio, the figure greeted him. Buongiorno. And your family, or at least what's left of it. What a pleasant surprise. He nodded to his men, 
who fanned out across the road, halberds at the ready. Vieri. The same. As soon as they released my father from custody, he was more than happy to finance this little hunting party for me. I was hurt. After all, how could you think of leaving Florence without saying a proper goodbye? Ezio advanced a pace, ushering Claudia and his mother behind him. What do you want, Vieri? I should have thought you'd be satisfied with what the Patsy have managed to achieve. Vieri spread his hands. What do I want? Well, it's hard to know where to begin. So many things. Let's see. Well, I'd like a larger palazzo, a prettier wife, much more money, and... What else? Oh, yes, your head! He drew his sword, motioning his guards to stay ready, and advanced on Ezio himself. I'm surprised, Vieri. Are you really going to take me on all alone? But, of course, your bully boys are right behind you. I don't think you're worthy of my sword, retorted Vieri, sheathing it again. I think I'll just finish you off with my fists. Sorry if this distresses you, Tesora, he added to Claudia. But don't worry, it won't take long. Then I'll see what I can do to comfort you. And who knows, maybe your little mamma as well. Ezio stepped forward fast and connected his fist to Vieri's jaw so that his enemy staggered, taken off guard. But, regaining his feet, Vieri waved his men back and hurled himself on to Ezio with a furious roar, piling on blow after blow. Such was the ferocity of Vieri's attack that while Ezio parried with skill, he was unable to land a meaningful blow of his own. Both men were locked together, wrestling for control, occasionally staggering back only to fling themselves at each other with renewed vigour. Eventually, Ezio was able to use Vieri's anger to work against him. No one ever fought effectively in a rage. Vieri wound up to throw a huge haymaker with his right. Ezio stepped forward and the blow glanced uselessly off his shoulder, Vieri's momentum carrying his weight forward uncontrolled. Ezio tripped up his opponent's heels and sent him rolling in the dust. Bleeding and bested, Vieri scrambled to safety behind his men and stood up, dusting himself down with his grazed hands. I tire of this, he said, and shouted to the guards. Finish him off, and the women too. I can do better than that scrawny little tadpole and her carcassa of a mother. Cornelio, yelled Ezio, panting for breath, drawing his sword, but the guards had formed a circle round him and extended their halberds. He knew he'd have a hard time closing with them. The circle tightened. Ezio kept swinging round, trying to keep his womenfolk behind him, but things looked black, and Vieri's unpleasant laugh was one of triumph. Suddenly there was a sharp, almost ethereal whistling noise, and two of the guards to Ezio's left crumpled to their knees and fell forward, dropping their weapons as they did so. From each of their backs projected a throwing knife, buried to the hilt and clearly aimed with deadly accuracy. Blood billowed out from their shirts, like crimson flowers. The others drew back in alarm, but not before one more of their number had fallen to the ground, a knife in his back. What sorcery is this? yelped Vieri, terror cutting his voice, drawing his sword and looking round wildly. He was answered by a deep-throated, booming laugh. Nothing to do with sorcery, boy. Everything to do with skill. The voice was coming from a nearby coppice. Show yourself! A large, bearded man wearing high boots and a light breastplate emerged from the little wood. Behind him, several others, similarly attired, appeared. "'As you wish,' he said sardonically. "'Mercenaries!' snarled Vieri, then turned to his own guards. "'What are you waiting for? Kill them! Kill them all!' But the large man stepped forward, wrested Vieri's sword from him with unbelievable grace, and snapped the blade over his knee as easily as if it had been a twig. I don't think that's a very good idea, little Patsy. No, I must say you live up to your family name. Vieri didn't answer, but urged his men on. 
Not very willingly, they closed with the strangers, while Vieri, picking up the halberd of one of his dead guards, rounded on Ezio, knocking his sword out of his hand and out of reach just as he was drawing it. Here, Ezio, use this, said the large man, throwing him another sword, which flew through the air to land on its point, quivering in the ground at his feet. In a flash, he'd picked it up. It was a heavy weapon, and he had to use both hands to wield it, but he was able to sever the shaft of Vieri's halberd. Vieri himself, seeing that his men were being easily bested by the condottieri, and that two more were already down, called off the attack and fled, hurling imprecations as he went. The large man approached Ezio and the women, grinning broadly. I'm glad I came out to meet you, he said. Looks as if I arrived just in time. You have my thanks, whoever you are. The man laughed again, and there was something familiar about his voice. Do I know you? asked Ezio. It's been a long time, but still I'm surprised you don't recognize your own uncle. Uncle Mario? The same! He gave Ezio a bear hug, and then approached Maria and Claudia. Distress clouded his face when he saw the condition Maria was in. Listen, child, he said to Claudia. I'm going to take Ezio back to the castello now, but I'm leaving my men to guard you, and they will give you something to eat and drink. I'll send a rider ahead, and he'll return with a carriage to bring you the rest of the way. You've done enough walking for one day, and I can see that my poor sister-in-law is... He paused before adding delicately. Tired out. Thank you, Uncle Mario. It's settled, then. We'll see you very soon. He turned and issued orders to his men, then put an arm round Ezio and guided him in the direction of his castle, which dominated the little town. How did you know I was on my way? asked Ezio. Mario looked a little evasive. Oh, a friend in Florence sent a messenger on horseback ahead of you. But I already knew what had happened. I haven't the strength to march on Florence, but now Lorenzo's back. Let us pray he can keep the patsy in check. You'd better fill me in on my brother's fate, and that of my nephew's. Ezio paused. The memory of his kinsmen's death still haunted the darkest part of his memories. They... they were all executed for treason. He paused. I escaped by the purest chance. My God, mouthed Mario, his face contorted with pain. Do you know why this happened? No. But it is something I hope you may be able to help me find answers to. And Ezio went on to tell his uncle about the hidden chest in the family palazzo and its contents, and of his revenge on Alberti and the documents he had taken from him. The most important looking is a list of names, he added, then broke off in grief. I cannot believe this has befallen us. Mario patted his arm. I know something of your father's business, he said and it occurred to Ezio that Mario hadn't shown much surprise when he told him of the hidden chest in the secret chamber. We'll make sense of this, but we must also make sure your mother and sister are properly provided for. My castle is not much of a place for women of any quality, and soldiers like me never really settle down. But there is a convent about a mile away where they will be completely safe and well cared for. If you agree, we will send them there. You and I have much to do. Ezio nodded. He would see them settled and persuade Claudia that it was the best temporary solution, for he could not see her wanting to remain long in such seclusion. They were approaching the little town. I thought Monterigioni was an enemy of Florence, Ezio said. Not so much of Florence as of the Pazzi, his uncle told him. But you are old enough to know about alliances between city-states, whether they are big ones or small ones. One year there is a friendship, the next enmity, and the following year there is friendship again. And so it seems to go on forever, like a mad game of chess. But you'll like it here. The people are honest and hard-working, and the goods we produce are solid and hard-wearing. The priest is a good man, doesn't drink too much, and minds his own business and I mind mine around him. 
but I've never been a very devoted son of the church myself. Best of all is the wine. The best Chianti you will ever taste comes from my own vineyards. Come, just a little further and we'll be there. Mario's castle was the ancient seat of the Auditori and had been built in the 1250s, though the site had originally been occupied by a much more ancient construction. Mario had refined and added to the building, which nowadays had more of the appearance of an opulent villa, though its walls were high, many feet in thickness, and well fortified. Before it, and in place of a garden, was a large practice field, where Ezio could see a couple of dozen young armed men engaged in various exercises to improve their fighting technique. Casa dolce casa, said Mario. You haven't been here since you were a little boy. Been some changes since then. What do you think? It's most impressive, uncle. The rest of the day was filled with activity. Mario showed Ezio around the castle, organized his accommodation, and made sure that Claudia and Maria had been safely housed in the nearby convent, whose abbess was an old and dear friend, and, it was rumored, long ago a mistress of Mario. But the following morning he was summoned early to his uncle's workroom, a large, high-ceilinged place, whose walls were festooned with maps, armor, and weapons, and furnished with a heavy oak table and chairs. You'd better get into the town quickly, Mario said one day soon afterwards in a businesslike voice. Get yourself properly kitted out. I'll send one of my men with you. Come back here when you've finished and we'll begin. Begin what, uncle? Mario looked surprised. I thought you'd come here to train. No, uncle, that was not my intention. This was the first place of safety I could think of once we had to flee Florence. But my intention is to take my mother and sister further still. Mario looked grave. But what about your father? Don't you think he'd want you to finish his work? What, as a banker? The family business is over. The house of Auditore is no more, unless Duke Lorenzo has managed to keep it out of Patsy hands. I wasn't thinking of that, began Mario, and then interrupted himself. Do you mean to say Giovanni never told you? I'm sorry, uncle, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Mario shook his head. I don't know what your father must have been thinking of. Perhaps he judged the time not to be right. But events have overtaken any such consideration now. He looked hard at Ezio. We must talk. Long and hard. Leave me the documents you have in your pouch. I must study them while you go into the town and get yourself equipped. Here's a list of what you'll need and money to pay for it. In a confused mood, Ezio set off for the town in the company of one of Mario's sergeants, a grizzled veteran called Orazio, and under his guidance acquired from the armourer there a battle dagger, light body armour, and, from the local doctor, bandages and a basic medical kit. He returned to the castle to find Mario waiting impatiently for him. Salute, said Ezio. I have done as you requested. And quickly, too. Ben fatto. And now we must teach you properly how to fight. Uncle, forgive me, but as I told you, I have no intention of staying. Mario bit his lip. Listen, Ezio, you were barely able to hold your own against Vieri. If I hadn't arrived when I did, he broke off. Well, leave if you must, but at least first learn the skills and knowledge you'll need to defend yourself, or you won't last a week on the road. Ezio was silent. If not for me, do it for the sake of your mother and sister, Mario pressed him. Ezio considered his options, but he had to admit that his uncle had a point. Well then, he said, since you've been kind enough to see me kitted out. Mario beamed and clapped him on the shoulder. Good man, you'll live to thank me. In the following weeks, the most intensive instruction in the use of arms followed. But while he was learning new battle skills, 
Ezio was also finding out more about his family background and the secrets his father had not had time to divulge to him. And, as Mario let him have the run of his library, he gradually became troubled by the fact that he might be on the verge of a far more important destiny than he had believed possible. You say my father was more than just a banker, he asked his uncle. Far more, replied Mario gravely. Your father was a highly trained killer. That cannot be. My father was always a financier, a businessman. How could he possibly have been a killer? No, Ezio. He was much more than that. He was born and bred to kill. He was a senior member of the Order of Assassins. Mario hesitated. I know you must have found out something more about all this in the library. We must discuss the documents that were entrusted to you, and which you, thank God, had the wit to retrieve from Alberti. That list of names, it isn't a catalogue of debtors, you know. It carries the names of all those responsible for your father's murder, and they are men who form part of a still greater conspiracy. Ezio struggled to take it all in. Everything he thought he knew about his father, his family, it all now seemed to be a half-truth. How could his father have kept this from him? It was all so inconceivable, so alien. Ezio chose his words with care. His father must have had a reason for this secrecy. I accept that there was more to my father than I ever knew, and forgive me for doubting your word, but why is the need for secrecy so great? Mario paused before replying. Are you familiar with the Order of the Knights Templar? I've heard of them. They were founded many centuries ago, soon after the first of the Crusades, and became an elite fighting force of warriors for God. Effectively, they were monks in armour. They took a pledge of abstinence and a vow of poverty. But the years rolled by and their status changed. In time, they became involved in international finance, and very successful they were at it too. Other orders of knights, the Hospitallers and the Teutonic Knights, looked on them askance, and their power began to be a cause for concern, even to kings. They established a base in southern France, and planned to form their own state. They paid no taxes, supported their own private army, and began to lord it over everyone. At last, nearly two hundred years ago, King Philip the Fair of France moved against them. There was a terrible purge. The Templars were arrested and driven away, massacred, and at last excommunicated by the Pope. But they could not all be rooted out. They had fifteen thousand chapters throughout Europe. Nevertheless, with their estates and properties annexed, the Templars seemed to disappear their power apparently broken. What happened to them? Mario shook his head. Of course it was a ruse to ensure their own survival. They went underground, hoarding the riches they had salvaged, maintaining their organisation, and bent more than ever now on their true goal. And what was that? What is that, you mean? Mario's eyes blazed. Their intention is nothing less than world domination. And only one organization is devoted to thwarting them. The Order of the Assassins, to which your father and I have the honor to belong. Ezio needed a moment to take this in. And was Alberti one of the Templars? Mario nodded solemnly. Yes as are all the others on your father's list. And Vieri? He is one as well, and his father Francesco, and all the Pazzi clan. Ezio pondered this. That explains much, he said. There is something I haven't shown you yet. He rolled up his sleeve to reveal his secret dagger. Ah, said Mario. You were wise not to reveal that until you were sure you could trust even me completely. I was wondering what had become of it. 
and I see that you have had it repaired. It was your father's, given to him by our father, and to him by his. It was broken in a, a confrontation your father was involved in many years ago, but he could never find a craftsman skilled or trustworthy enough to restore it. You have done well, my boy. Even so, said Ezio. All this talk of assassins and Templars sounds like something from an ancient tale. It reeks of the fantastic. Mario smiled. Like something from an old parchment, covered in arcane writing, perhaps? You know of the Codex page? Mario shrugged. Had you forgotten? It was with the papers you handed over to me. Can you tell me what it is? Ezio was somehow reluctant to involve his friend Leonardo in this unless it became strictly necessary. Well, whoever repaired your blade must have been able to read at least some of it, said Mario. But he raised his hand as Ezio was about to open his mouth. But I will ask you no questions. I can see that you wish to protect someone, and I will respect that. But there is more to the page than the working instructions for your weapon. The pages of the Codex are scattered now throughout Italy. It is a guide to the inner workings of the Assassin's Order, its origin, purpose, and techniques. It is, if you will, our creed. Your father believed that the Codex contained a powerful secret, something that would change the world. He paused for thought. Perhaps that is why they came for him. Ezio was overwhelmed at this information. It was a huge amount to take in all at once. Assassins, Templars, this strange codex, I will be your guide, Ezio. But you must first learn to open your mind, and always remember this. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Mario would tell him nothing more then, though Ezio pressed him. Instead, his uncle continued to put him through the most rigorous process of military training, and from dawn to dusk he found himself exercising with a young condottieri on the practice ground, falling into bed each night, too exhausted to think of anything but sleep. And then, one day... Well done, nephew, his uncle told him. I think you are ready. Ezio was pleased. Thank you, uncle, for all you've given me. Mario's answer was to give the boy a bear hug. Your family! Such is my duty and desire! I'm glad you persuaded me to stay. Mario looked at him keenly. So? Have you reconsidered your decision to leave? Ezio returned his gaze. I'm sorry, uncle, but my mind is made up. For the safety of Mamma and Claudia... I still intend to make for the coast and take ship for Spain. Mario did not hide his displeasure. Forgive me, nephew, but I have not taught you the skills you now have either for my own amusement or your exclusive benefit. I have taught you so that you may be better prepared to strike against our enemies. And if they find me, so I will. So, Mario said bitterly, you want to leave? To throw away everything your father fought and died for? To deny your very heritage? Well, I cannot pretend to you that I am not disappointed, highly disappointed. But so be it. Orazio will take you to the convent when you judge the moment to be right for your mother to travel, and he will see you on your way. I wish you buona fortuna. With that, Mario turned his back on his nephew and stalked away. More time passed, as Ezio found he had to allow his mother enough peace and quiet to pave the way to her recovery. He himself made his preparations for leaving with a heavy heart. At last he set out to pay what he imagined might be his last visit to the convent to visit his mother and sister before taking them away and found them better than he dared to hope. 
Claudia had made friends with some of the younger nuns, and it was clear to Ezio, to his surprise, and not greatly to his pleasure, that she was beginning to be attracted to the life. Meanwhile, his mother was making a steady but slow recovery, and the abbess, on hearing of his plans, demurred, advising him that rest was what she still badly needed, and that she should not be moved again just yet. When he returned to Mario's castle, therefore, he was full of misgivings, and he was aware that these misgivings had grown with time. At that period, some kind of military preparations had been going on in Monterigioni, and now they seemed to be coming to a head. The sight of them distracted him. His uncle was nowhere to be seen, but he managed to track Orazio down to the map room. What's going on? he asked. Where's my uncle? He's preparing for battle. What? With whom? Oh, I expect he'd have told you if he thought you were staying, but we all know that that is not your intention. Well, listen, your old friend Vieri de Pazzi has set himself up at San Gimignano. He's tripping the garrison there and has let it be known that as soon as he's ready, he's coming to raise Monteregioni to the ground. So we're going there first, to crush the little snake and teach the Pazzi a lesson they won't forget in a hurry. Ezio took a deep breath. Surely this changed everything. And perhaps it was fate, the very stimulus he'd unconsciously been seeking. Where is my uncle? In the stables. Ezio was already halfway out of the room. Hey, where are you off to? To the stables. There must be a horse for me, too. Orazio smiled as he watched him go.